Interpreting Ravi Zacharias from episode 60 of the Sunday Morning Special featuring Abdu Murray. What is the toughest question for a believer? I think the toughest question is, how can a God that is all good, all powerful, and fully in control allow or permit so much pain and suffering in the world? How do you answer that question? I think if you already believe in God, then Job gives a meaningful answer. He said, I had heard of you by the listening of my ear, and now that I have seen you, I hate myself and I am very afraid. Then he repented. He changed his ways and was able to have a relationship with God. It was similar with Habakkuk, who had an experience with God after a time with a lot of pain. After everything, he said, One, God is. Two, God acts. Three, God changes. One means that you know God is actually real. This is different from atheism. Two means you know he will do things in our lives. And this is different from deism. Three means you know God's perspective is beyond time and above creation. And this is different from pantheism. So in short, I think if you are someone who is a believer in God, you can have faith that when you have a direct experience with God, that he will give you eyes to see things in your life like he sees them. If you're a person who does not know God, I would answer the question of why God allows badness with another question. When you say evil is real, do you see how you are also saying goodness is real? And when you say that goodness and badness are real, do you see how you are also saying there is a real and consistently defined measurement for morality? that we use to know the difference between good and bad? Objective is what we call something that is always real, and every person behaves in a way that shows and confirms that it is real. Like how when we play soccer, we show gravity is real everywhere on earth. Absolute is what we call something that is consistently defined everywhere, and understood as being the same, everywhere. Like how the whole world agrees on the idea that the winner of a soccer match is the team with more goals at the end of an agreed-upon amount of time. From now on, we will call this absolute and objective measurement for morality the moral law. Returning to the question... If you know there is a difference between good and bad, and this shows that there is a moral law, then you also must admit that a moral law giver makes sense. And the existence of a God that could give this moral law is what you want to disprove with the question about evil. So the problem of badness actually disappears in the question. Here's an interesting quote from a debate between a famous atheist, Russell, and a known theist, Collison. Collison, how do you know good from bad? Russell, the same way I know blue from green. Collison, wait, you know green from blue because you use your eyes, yes? Russell, yes. Collison, So what do you use to know good from bad? Russell. My feelings. What else?
So why do you need a moral law giver or a legislator in order to have a moral law? Every time a question about evil is asked, it is either asked by a person or about a person. And this means the person who asked the question believes that people have a natural worth, or in other words, that people have value from birth. And that is not something you can say if you think we changed in random ways over time from less complicated animals. If we are a random mixture of atoms, how do we attribute innate value to ourselves? So when you ask the question, why does God allow evil? It shows you believe people have intrinsic value at their core. And this again shows that a moral law giver makes the most sense. So to me, the question of evil defeats itself because you need to look at the world in a way that shows God is logical to be able to think of the question to begin with. How do we know what the moral law is? This is a question about if something is true or not. In philosophy, there are two measurements for truth. Correspondence is about if a single statement is correct, if the words match what happened. Coherence is about if a group of statements are presented accurately, if the words agree with each other internally, and with the things that we already know to be true externally. To me, there are three ways to find truth, the notions of truth. One is logical consistency. This means that you have made sure there are no contradictions. Two is empirical adequacy. This means we see lots of things happen in life that show it to be true. Three is experiential relevance. This means that things have happened to you that show it to be true. Then we apply these three ways to the four questions of life. One, origin. Where do I come from? Two, meaning. What does my life really mean? Three, morality. How do I know the difference between good and bad? Four, destiny. What happens to a person when he or she dies? When you decide what your world when you decide what your world view is, these are the four questions you have to answer by applying the notions of truth. That explains the human side of knowing what the moral law is. Now when we discuss the idea of God giving us moral laws, it is not as simple as a book of rules falling from the sky. You take the things God has taught us over all the years of humanity and you apply these tests of the logic of truth to the four questions of life. When you do this, you see that if it is true that God is real, this causes the questions of life to make sense and soothes the pain of our struggle with them. This is because those four questions become real for us when we can be sure of the value God gave people when he made us. So God did give us rules, but those rules have also been tested by logic and proven over time. So I think we get to the question of who God is, not only by a leap of faith, but also by a very logical evaluation of the scriptures. So it's not just that God gives us the law, or that we are deciding what the law is. It's both working together. It has been a process of people working to learn the correct understanding of the moral law that God has been revealing consistently from the beginning.
What about how the moral law has changed? Like how in the Old Testament, slavery is talked about as a sad fact of life. And then it was well after the New Testament was written that we decided slavery was against the moral law. How do you explain that? I would ask where this story or fantasy that people understand the moral law better today than we did in the past came from. If we have become more moral, why has war killed more people in the last hundred years than the rest of human history combined? The most important point here is that morality alone will never save us. People have done horrible things in the name of keeping morality. The fact of the matter is that the human heart is in need of redemption and forgiveness. Then there is the fact that because of the Ten Commandments, we have known what morality is all about from the beginning of human history. The problem with thinking that we have become more moral is that all of the evil behaviors we see in the first three chapters of Genesis are still happening today and often in even worse ways. We have had the answers for 3,500 years, and still we try to go our own way based on our own rules, and every time that we do this, we lead ourselves into wars and societies of domination and oppression. So what has the problem been for all of human history? Exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Will people try to play God by making their own knowledge of good and evil, or will we listen to what God said about the knowledge of good and evil? We have this pattern in which God has told us what will work best in the world he designed. Then we decide to go our own way, and when things go wrong, what do we do? We blame anything and anyone else, just like Adam blamed Eve first, and then Eve blamed the snake. Playing the victim is a game as old as our history is long. But the price for being able to choose if we want to obey God or not is that we become accountable. This means we are responsible for what comes after our actions. So I do not accept this idea that morality has gotten better over time. From the start of known history, we have been told the value of human life and the value of a moral law. This is why it was believers like William Wilberforce leading the intellectual and political movement in Europe to abolish the slave trade. What about sin and morality? For example, if two people agree to do something between themselves that they enjoy, that does not harm any other people, it does not seem wrong in any moral sense. So how do you explain sin as it relates to morality? I think sin is a vertical term, not just a horizontal term. In Psalm 51, when David falls on his face before God after his sins concerning Bathsheba, what does he say? He says, Against you alone, God, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So in my view, sin is a vertical thing. The problem with morality is that if we limit ourselves to a moral framework limited to human thinking alone, you will find that something is right or wrong depending on if you are in India, Cambodia, or America. This makes morality too abstract and contradictory to pass the coherence test of truth. So the difference to me is that a sin happens when God gives you direct instructions and then you decide to do the opposite or to do a different thing that you think is better. There's no sin in God. That means there's no contradiction in God. 
He cannot contradict himself, nor can that which contradicts him be harmonious with his presence. God is self-existent. He depends on only himself to exist. This means it is impossible for him to not exist. He exists eternally and is the source for all that exists temporarily. So it is logical that we must also be devoid of anything that contradicts God if we want to join Him in eternity. What matters is if I obey my Heavenly Father. So what is wrong? I think the core of knowing right from wrong is knowing the purpose. To violate the purpose of a living thing is wrong. Let's use the automobile as an example. The person who designed the car had a specific purpose in mind when they made it. It was made to help people travel faster and farther. So what is the appropriate thing to do if a person takes a car and decides to use it to crash into another person with the intention to kill them? Do we arrest the car maker, or do we arrest the person who used the car for murder? In this example, the automobile represents morality. This is what I think we have done with our values. We've taken the car used it in a way that contradicts its purpose, and then blamed the car maker. Then, based on this, some of us want to throw out the owner's manual. So I think morality is good for helping people manage to live in the same area as other people in an orderly and harmonious way, but morality alone will not save Western society or the world unless we develop accountability to our Creator. Not just for moral reason, but for the fact that we understand that life is sacred at its core. Looking at life and not seeing that it is sacred is the root of all of our moral and social problems. We ourselves do not yet know what it means to be human. This is also why trusting an artificial intelligence to dictate morality would be misguided. Because it is not alive with the life given by the creator of life, it would not be logical to think it would better understand the sacredness of life in the core of all living people. So what about the role of government? Should the government enforce morality? Before discussing what the government might do better, let me first say what I know the government should not do. When you think of liberals and conservatives, it all depends on location. If I'm talking of the mullahs in Iran, then I pray the Lord would save us from that kind of conservative. The kind of mindset in which the government has no respect for dissenting opinions does not reflect the way God gave people the choice to believe in Him or to become a non-believer and to obey or disobey, like we see God doing in the story of Adam and Eve. If God did not force people to believe and obey, it is not logical that we should give ourselves that authority over others either. Certainly that does not show humility before God. But then for the secular side, if you look at what happened with Stalin in Russia, did you know that at one time Stalin considered Christianity and even went to seminary? Did you know that his last act on earth was to clench his fist and shake it with hatred towards God in the heavens? This was after he killed 15 million of his own people in an atheist regime you see that both conservative religious groups and liberal secular groups both end up in the same place of murder and oppression when they do not follow the example God showed us when he gave people intellectual independence or choice.
So I think we need to stop thinking right and left, and we should begin thinking up and down. I do not think we will make progress in politics until we can agree on one answer for this question. What does it mean to be human? Are we just a better animal, or did God make us special? Until I can answer that question, how can I answer why it is important to not have an affair, or why it is important to treat my children with love, or why I ought to be a good citizen? And to me, a good citizen is someone who is willing to accept the value of every human life and to live peacefully with people who are different, and that have different beliefs. To me, the question is if exclusive secularism is really what we want to become at the core of our government. If I'm a good and moral person, and I behave in all the ways we agree a good citizen should act, then why would I still need God? This is a good question, and it is a question that comes from an idea that the most important thing is my autonomy. That means when I ask this question, it shows that I think all that really matters is being a law unto myself. So really, this question is a question of values. It is a question of what is more or less important to you. But it is also important to remember that there are a number of skeptics and people who do not believe in God who behave so well morally that they put many of us to shame. But the true issue with the question is that I'm using a word which refers to only my thinking when I say I am a good person without God's guidance. If I'm going to say I am good based on my own thinking only, then both of these can be true. One, if I am from America, I can say I am moral if I feed my neighbor. Two, If I am from Indonesian New Guinea, I can say I am moral if I kill my neighbor and then I eat my neighbor. Think about what we are doing when we call ourselves a good society based on only our ideas of morality. Then consider some of the decisions that we are making at the top levels of lawmakers. And we are bold enough to call ourselves good? So it is not logical to call anything good unless you believe in absolutes. Which means that something can be absolutely true anywhere for everyone. This idea is similar to how a person who only speaks Chinese can watch a soccer match on a Spanish-speaking television channel and still know which team is winning. We can know the difference between bad soccer and skillful soccer, regardless of where it is played, because as a concept, the game has an absolute set of basic principles. So to say that all truth is relative is a self-destructive statement. It destroys itself when applied in life. The moment you say or think something like slavery is wrong or compassionate charity is a better characteristic than coerced charity, you have begun to act in a way that agrees truth is not relative, that there is an absolute definition. So I say to give oneself the authority of defining what is good or bad leads to a world of chaos. America has a lot to say about rights, but has still not been able to define what is right. My rights stand on the foundation of an absolute definition of what is right. 
And that is why there are so many believers like William Wilberforce who were at the front of the fight to abolish the international slave trade. It was because they had an absolute definition of what is right from God, which they could use to prove it was wrong for anybody, anywhere on earth, to enslave anybody else, no matter what the culture or where the enslavement happened. What about the believers who force their absolute moral law on others who don't believe in their God? First, I think anyone who forces a religious belief on someone else has a religion that is not based on the example set by God in the story of Adam and Eve. Because God himself gave us one of the greatest gifts we have, the freedom to believe in him or disbelieve in him. So if a person believes in the Bible and attempts to force someone else to agree, they have acted in a way that contradicts God. But if a person believes in atheism, it makes perfect sense to force someone else to agree with you or even kill them if they disagree with you, because without God, it is logical that morality is relative and that other people do not have essential value that we are required to respect. The same is true of genocide, of slavery, or of racism. Relativism and atheism open the door for people to justify treating other people as less valuable without contradiction, while for theists and believers, this is a contradiction. God gives us the ability to choose to believe or disbelieve. But a thing he did not do was give us the ability to change what happens after you choose between those two options. There will be a natural and logical outcome for both choices that I can see with my reasoning. So this means I will be accountable for what comes from my choice to believe or disbelieve. I think we need to be free to talk with each other about our beliefs and look to find truth using logic and kindness. But if God did not force humanity to believe in him, neither should anybody else. Both sides should have the freedom to speak and all listeners the freedom to accept or reject. The key is to be respectful in the process, to be kind to everyone in the process, to follow the example of Jesus in the process. What do you say to the idea in some scientific groups that we do not have real choice or free will? They say everything is set on a predetermined course by a chain of inevitable chemical reactions, including the thoughts in our minds. To support this idea, these groups refer to lab experiments that suggest the brain is active before a person is aware of the thought. Well, that is an idea called determinism, and goes back to B.F. Skinner in the 1970s and was the same attempt to escape responsibility at that time as it is today. Responding to this idea, I ask a simple question. Is what you are saying true or just your own predetermined thoughts? Is it just your neurons firing that made you decide this? Or do you believe there is an objective reason why determinism is true? And can that objective reason defeat the objective experiences of all the other people on earth regarding choice? I see it as a very clever gimmick to avoid responsibility. 
For people to live like determinism is true, we would have to do away with judicial courts and destroy all jails because it would not be logical to hold anyone responsible. If a person breaks into a house, kills one person, rapes another person, and leaves with their money, this was all predetermined, which means the intruder was always going to do these things if he wanted or not, and it would have been impossible for them to know or decide to act in a different way. If you recall our example of a soccer match and how by playing the game a soccer player shows that gravity is an objective phenomenon to all who watches that soccer match on television. Now suppose this soccer player believes the planet Earth is flat, which is a theory that requires him to reject gravity. He still proves gravity when he plays. The soccer player cannot reconcile his flat planet Earth theory with his own actions on the soccer pitch, so he certainly cannot convince all the people watching the match that what they know and experience of gravity is wrong. In the same way, if someone who believes in determinism tries to say a person has the right to be treated with respect, or tries to say something like slavery is wrong, that person has begun to act in a way that betrays determinism and supports the idea of human choice in the context of an objective and absolute moral law. I would then tell the story of when I was visiting prisoners on death row in Louisiana. One prisoner had made many crosses out of threads and yarns and had painted scenes with religious themes on many canvases and put them all over his jail cell. I spoke to him for a time and he told me about the redemption he found in Jesus when he started reading the Bible that was in his jail cell on death row. I asked him what went so wrong in this life that he ended up here. He answered to me that if he had first found a Bible in his table at school, he would not have needed to come to death row to find it. I would ask the scientist who believes the human experience is predetermined by a chain of reactions. If experiences of personality transformation like this are predetermined, or is it something that society can celebrate? That this man found freedom from the pain which pushed him to do evil and that he was able to find peace in his heart to start doing what is good. What significance or value is there for freedom from inner slavery if determinism is true? And further, if determinism is true, then you have no logical reason to criticize a believer or anyone else who disagrees with you, because that person's belief is predetermined just like yours. The moment you make a measurement that says one thing as better than something else, you have stopped acting in a way that agrees with the idea of determinism. As soon as you say certain things or ideas have higher quality than others, you have slipped into agreeing with your actions that there are objective and absolute definitions. And when you contradict yourself in this way, you have shown us the contradiction in your belief. So in your opinion, what did Christianity add to the world that was not already done by Judaism? I don't like to say the word add because I think it already existed. Of course, the ancestors of Ravi Zacharias were Orthodox Hindu priests for generations at the top class of the Hindu priesthood. So that is the background of the man who spoke the words this interpretation is based on. 
The one verse I think that moral law hangs on is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Because here is where we see the redemption theme. I think with Jesus, redemption moved past a metaphor in Egypt, even though that was real, and it moved past animal sacrifices, and it moved to the very real person of the Son of Man who Daniel spoke of. And I see that the perfection of the law was not broken, but it was really affirmed and endorsed. So what I see in the person of Jesus Christ are two very real things. One, it is the fact that Jesus lived a life which God judged to be perfect based on a moral law God had given the Jews that had 613 very detailed rules. David lowered it to 15, and then Isaiah lessened it to 11, and then Micah made it only three laws. One, to do justice. Two, to love mercy. And three, to, to walk humbly before God. And if you go to Habakkuk, he said, the good will live by faith. So when you move into the person of Christ, two things happen. First, the law is honored and not challenged. Then the second thing that happens in Jesus is a relationship with God. I have a story about this kind of closeness in a relationship. One time my daughter was in a hurry, looking around the house for her keys, and she stopped and said, Am I losing my mind? To this my five-year-old granddaughter said, Mummy, whatever you do, please don't lose your heart because I am in there. That is the kind of personal relationship which forms between a person and God when a person believes in Jesus. And as much as I love the law and the good that comes from the law, I need to go beyond that to the kind of closeness with God that I see here. If I were to pick one or two moments in the New Testament that I think are the most beautiful, the first would be what Jesus said on Emmaus Road in Luke 24, 13 through 35. And then my second favorite is when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus showed his glorious spiritual body. When he was there on the mountain in his glorious spiritual body, who are the people he brings with him? Moses and Elijah. These men are two of the most powerful prophets, and after passing into the next life, their souls answered to Jesus. We don't know exactly where Moses was buried, and Elijah goes up on chariots of fire. And then Jesus goes to the cross to pay for what I cannot. This example of redemption in which the most pure decides by their own free will to pay the penalty for the impurity of others. Not that there was no penalty, but that Jesus chose to pay the penalty and then rose from death by his own power. In my view, it is a mixture that does not challenge the Jewish law that came before. And for me to explain the agreement, let me give an example. I was in Jerusalem some years ago when I met a professor of Islam named Moshe Sharon. I'll tell you what he said to me. He said, Let me tell you something you do not know about me. I am a professor but I used to work for the Mossad. You're a Christian, and I'm a Jewish man, but we have one thing in common. We aim for communion with God. But when I picked up extremists that had blown themselves up, what people do not know is they tie a lead belt around their reproductive parts to protect what they believe they would finally be using in paradise. 
That is a different world view. You and I can understand each other because we have the same goal, sharing intimate thoughts and feelings with God. But if a person is motivated by an idea of heaven that is based on erotic rewards, then I am not on the same page as that person. We have completely different goals. So I say to me in Christ, I see the completion of the story because I want more than just mental truth. When Jesus comes down from the mountain and Peter goes to him, what does Peter say? But now the word of the prophets has been made absolutely certain for us, and everyone will do well to pay attention to it as a light in a dark place. So I think it is a completion. What do you think makes Judeo-Christian faith different from other religions that believe in one true God? Well, there is what Moshe Sharon said. I also see how an idea of heaven motivated by sexual rewards contradicts what God has shown us of his character and kingdom in the Bible and Torah. I think we already know that the motivation for heaven is worshiping God in the spirit, not pleasures of the flesh. But also, if we are going to compare religions, I think we Christians are now paying a penalty for our wrongs throughout history. The church has made huge blunders. We should not try to hide from that. Even the way the church handled scientific progress was absolutely sinful at times. But what do the sins of the church really show? What they end up proving is the depravity of man. It proves how bad people can truly be. It does not prove who Jesus is or what the Bible actually teaches. What this proves is that people become corrupt when we give ourselves power over other people. So I say we need to admit our mistakes and accept responsibility for them, but I also say that we have not made more mistakes than anybody else. Since the 20th century, more people were killed by atheist communist regimes than by any other group. Consider the way of modern atheist governments in China, Russia, Vietnam, and Cambodia. I do not even want to speak of the things being done there under atheist rule. Even today, what is being done to human beings under secular communist regimes is an atrocity. The fact of the matter is, if you exclude Judeo-Christian worldview based on its sins, this shows you are prejudiced in a way that is not supported by history. So I say, we will have the best results in society if people have the freedom to believe or disbelieve. I do not support the idea of a theocracy or government of religion. Forcing religious beliefs is the best way to kill faith. I believe the most important places we need to have this right to believe or disbelieve are our places of learning. If schools and universities will open their doors to logical and kind conversation with people who believe in God, I believe we will start to see positive social change. Why couldn't a sovereign God just forgive sin without a sacrifice? This question is about logical consistency. If you think about a God, which is supposed to be the greatest possible being, and all the monotheistic faiths agree with this, even the pantheistic faiths agree with this to some degree, saying something like, if there were a god, it would be the greatest possible being. 
So what two qualities would the greatest possible being possess? The qualities it would most likely possess are 1. Absolute justice without compromise. This means giving people exactly what they deserve. 2. Absolute mercy without compromise. This means giving people something they don't deserve. So the problem is this. How can God be absolutely just and absolutely merciful at the same time? How can he be logically consistent without compromise? Because if God is fully just, he would never compromise his justice. Because if he compromised, he wouldn't be the greatest possible judge. He would lose something in the process. This would be to denigrate his very nature. It would be diminishing his own characteristics. Then if he wasn't absolutely, completely, and justifiably merciful, he would stop being the greatest merciful being there could be. This would also compromise and diminish himself. So if someone were to commit a transgression against God, and in so doing has offended him, a temporal act which actually offends the Eternal One has an eternal effect. So here's the problem. How is God supposed to forgive this sin? Just because someone is sorry? Does that make sense? Just because they're sorry doesn't mean they haven't done something with an eternal effect. They have still caused a debt for themselves against the maker of the entire universe. The Holy One is rightfully offended in some way, or a debt has been incurred to that very God. And all religious systems recognize this concept, at least to some measure. Even the Quran in Surah 35 and verse 45. If God were to judge according to what it deserves, he would not leave on the back of the earth even one living thing. That's how serious sin actually is in the world. It actually taints and pollutes the entire world. So is it logical for a God who sees sin as a pollutant to the entire world to forgive sin just because you felt bad for a little while? No! If God did that, he would cease to be just. Yet, if he didn't forgive it, he would cease to be merciful. And this is actually what the cross is all about. So he died on the cross to do what? To pay the price we rightfully deserve. That's mercy. And he makes sure that the price is paid by paying it himself on the cross. That's justice. Both converge on the cross. It's the logical consistency here that's compelling. It's logically consistent and based on the empirical adequacy of the historical cross. It actually happened. Everyone who studies Jesus agrees on this fact of history. This is where the beauty of the Trinity actually comes into play. What I love about the Christian faith is that it's logically consistent, but it's also logically coherent. So God is one and three. He is one in his nature with three distinct personhoods. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. Yet they share the same nature. They have the same whatness, but they have a different whoness. So when Jesus, the Son, pays the price to the Father, 
It's not taking money from his right pocket and putting it into his left pocket. That's not what's happening here. It's not a fiction. The son, who is distinct in his personhood from the father, actually pays the father. It's a real transaction. It's a real transaction because God is triune. So this makes it all coherent. It all makes sense internally. So God, in his own inimitable way, merges the seemingly contradictory mercy and justice. This can only be done if God is a trinity. Now this is a uniquely Christian system, and it's a logically coherent system, and it is a logically consistent system, and it also bears the marks of empirical adequacy, because everybody who truly studies history knows that it actually happened. How can we reach this generation? Don't answer questions, answer people, because questions don't need answers. People need answers, and they use their questions to get answers. So first you must listen carefully and understand what their questions are. I think in the current culture, when you're listening to somebody, and giving them that dignity, which every person is looking for, because we constantly seem to be robbing each other of dignity. So you can shatter a stereotype if you will just listen. I was speaking with an atheist young man who was outraged by racism, and I asked him, Can you tell me what justifies your outrage? If I'm a chemical machine, and you're a chemical machine, is there anything immoral in the act of me removing you from the picture because you're in my way? Or is there something about us that is intrinsically valuable? You have a strong sense of morality. I can see it in you by your anger towards racism. But what justifies your deep and strong sense of morality on this topic? We connected on an issue of agreement but we use that agreement to talk about our disagreements in an agreeable way. Listen, and when you speak, speak graciously. In a post-truth world. Well, what is a post-truth world? A post-truth world is one which elevates feelings and preferences above facts and truth. It's not denying that the truth exists, we simply put it on the bottom shelf because what we really care about are our preferences. So the truth exists, but we don't care unless it happens to mesh with our preferences, in which case we do care. The problem with that is this, and this is another way to reach this generation. The problem is that this generation is becoming increasingly pragmatic. In other words, I believe what works. And the problem with post-truth is that it doesn't work. And one of the most fundamental ways that it does not work is in society. If preferences matter more than truth, and I'm autonomous, you know, we talk about freedom all the time, but our demand has not been freedom for many years. Our demand today is autonomy. Freedom is different from autonomy. Freedom has boundaries, and one of those boundaries is truth, and another is morality. Autonomy is the ability to do whatever we want, whenever we want, and in whatever way we want. So the problem with post-truth in society is this. If I'm autonomous and another person is autonomous, and I have preferences which matter more than the truth, 
and the other person also has preferences, and their preferences matter more than the truth. When two autonomous, preference-seeking beings come together and their preferences don't match, who is going to win? If truth is on the bottom shelf, then truth won't decide. What will decide will be power. And isn't it ironic, then, that in our quest for autonomy, someone always gets enslaved? So if you are able to listen well, ask the right questions. Hear the issues that they are actually dealing with. Then point out these types of problems with a post-truth world view and how it doesn't actually get us anywhere. It takes us to exactly the place we are trying to get away from. Then I think they will be more ready to listen to the hope that truth will bring.